Good afternoon. It's nice to see some sunshine today after um, we've gotten all this good rain. We are in our study of the Beatitudes. Um, the reminders that I will give you that have, as we've gone along is, first of all, the Beatitudes are sort of serve as the introduction to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which was his first public address. Um, and it is worth noting that instead of threatening um, and, and warning the evildoers, Jesus to <clears throat> chose to uh, offer blessings for uh, wonderful Christian characteristics. And he is trying to show his listeners what those who follow him will be growing into. Uh, in many ways, he's describing himself and his characteristics. And as we find ourselves with an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we began to exhibit those uh, unique characteristics ourselves. Um, it started with blessed are the poor in spirit because the first part of our spiritual journey is recognizing our need. That's being poor in spirit. As we recognize our need, we grieve our sin. So blessed are those who mourn their sin. And as we mourn our sin, we become humble, humble in our uh, posture before God. Now, those first three are focusing on our state of being as followers of Christ. The next one focuses our attention on God. Blessed are those who seek, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. We are hungering and thirsting for more of God. <clears throat> and as we seek that righteousness, God allows us to obtain righteousness as we go along. And that leads us to the next beatitude, which is to be merciful. He's merciful to us, and we are to be merciful to others. And that caring and forgiving, merciful attitude leads us to the next beatitude, which is blessed are the pure in heart. We've been seeking, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We experience God's mercy and become merciful, and we experience a cleansing of our heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Our hymn is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. 
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We'll read our opening together. Jesus, we want to meet on this thy holy day. We gather around thy throne on this thy holy day. Thou art our heavenly friend. Hear our prayers as they ascend. Look into our hearts and minds today on this thy holy day. Thy blessing, Lord, we seek on this thy holy day. Give joy of thy victory on this thy holy day. Through grace alone are we saved. In thy flock may we be found. Let the mind of Christ abide in us on this thy holy day. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is that Jesus is originally, his audience were folks that were reared in Judaism. And they believed, as Israelites, as Hebrews, as Jews, they believed that they were called apart. Called apart from pagan cultures, called apart from ways of the world to be holy and to be Jehovah's. And they thought that that holiness was acquired by adhering to the laws and sacrifices and rituals that had been uh, designated in the Old Testament. They believed that they could draw nearer to God in their worship. So now Jesus is teaching <clears throat> there's more to it. They should be more than externally holy. They need to be pure in heart. And they could do more than just go to a holy place. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit allowed them to become pure in heart, which would allow them to actually see God. Um, and so we're talking today about the heart of the matter. And Matthew 5, 8 is the scripture, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's talk a little bit about the heart first. Uh, the heart we know of is physically like the engine of our body. It's a wonderful mechanism that, that runs night and day, whether we're waking or sleeping, moving gallons of blood through our body. And that description doesn't include all that we can think about the heart. Um, the truth is, whether it's the tiniest hummingbird who has a heart the size of a, an eraser on a pencil, a teeny little heart, to the heart of a blue whale, which has a heart the size of a 55-gallon oil drum, it makes no difference. They all function as an engine for an organism. But we think of the heart symbolically, too, as the center of our emotions. And that's probably because when we are upset, or when we are excited, or when we are afraid, or nervous, or all of these emotions that we experience cause our heart to behave in a different way, cause it to skip beats, cause it to race faster, cause it to slow down. Um, and so that's probably one of the reasons that initially uh, the heart was tied to the emotion because it seemed to respond to our emotions. And it and nowadays, we speak of a lot of things in that way. We say, oh, that was heartbreaking. 
if it was really sad, or he's a heart throb, he's somebody that uh, makes your heart beat fast, or someone was heartless, they didn't care, or heart sick, maybe they were lonely, or maybe we talk about a story being heartwarming, uh, full of love and compassion, <clears throat> but all of those things in contemporary times are how we symbolically attach something to the heart besides just moving blood through our body. The biblical writers went even further than that because they used the word heart uh, to describe the whole human personality not just the emotions, but the will. Someone had heart if they were brave and strong and set goals and worked hard. They, um, if their will was their heart or their character, their integrity was linked up to their heart as well as the emotions that we've already talked about. Jesus said in, in one translation, it would say, Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude is a promise that the pure in heart will be happy because they will see God. Now, speaking about purity, previous generations considered purity to be a virtue, and they were very Certain, certain generations were very strict about that. Today, we think of it not so much as a virtue. Uh, we think of it as a discipline to be endured or to be ignored. And it seems that today, even the privilege of seeing God is not that enticing. We sort of expect to see God in eternity and not necessarily when we're here on earth. So it just doesn't ha seem to have much meaning for us. We're going to try to change that as we look through the meaning of this beatitude. And the first question we have to address is, what does pure or purity mean? I remember the first thing when I read that question was uh, commercials when I was a child. Commercials for ivory soap that said, this soap is 99.44% pure. And that meant it was pure of dyes and perfumes. Um, but if we are speaking in a spiritual sense here about purity, Purity is being virtuous. Purity is being free from sin, perhaps, or it means to be clean, or to be full of goodness, or to be unmixed or undiluted. Um, those are definitions from Webster's that have to do with the meaning of pure or purity. But let's see what the Bible means by pure in heart. Um, the Greek word, katharos, in Jesus' day meant clean. And it, the usage of it, uh, one of the uses was that it would describe clothing that had been washed. And it was described as pure. Or it could be describing what happens when they winnow uh, the grain and the shaft is separated from the grain. That was purity or pure. And another unusual sort of uh, use of it was when an army had managed to purge itself of the cowardly soldiers or the ineffective soldiers, that was called 
being the army was pure then. So pure of heart refers to one whose character has been cleansed, who is unspoiled. Uh, one philosopher said that purity of heart is to will, desire, go after one thing, a singleness of life and purpose. As Christ teaches, um, pure of heart means freedom from corruption, uh, things of the world, and it means freedom from divided affections. Uh, do you remember the scripture that says you can't serve God and mammon? You can't have a divided heart. You must be pure in heart. Um, that term, the purity, refers to sincerity and genuineness and singleness of heart. It's a kind of integrity where your beliefs and your thoughts and your words and your actions are all in alignment, in alignment with God. Um, the bib biblical purity of heart includes thoughts, words, and deeds. It can be seen in our language, whether we're pure in heart. It can be seen in what we read and what we listen to and watch. Uh, you've probably heard the modern phrase, garbage in, garbage out. What we spend time watching and listening and reading about and talking about and thinking about and spending money on, those things end up being our character. They affect our character. Um, and what we want is to have filled ourselves up with the things of, of God's kingdom, the spiritual gifts of his kingdom. And then those are what come out of us when we have uh, allowed ourselves to be filled with them. Our culture seems to be against any kind of purity. Impurity of heart may be the paramount sickness of our time. And if that's true, purity of heart, purity of heart might be our greatest single need. We are fed an almost constant diet of violence, easy sex, coarse language, selfishness and greed, and in such a setting, it's difficult, if not impossible, to be pure in heart. For one thing, the average city dweller has very few moments in their day to examine his or her soul. The automobile, television, radio, computer, phone are constant distractions we're actually robbed of our time to contemplate what is pure and what isn't. The great saints of the past depended on time, quiet time, a, a serene alone time for contemplation. In our world, the emphasis is heavily on the material, the sensual, and the here and now. Now, a lot of that, uh, that, the things that occupy us in the modern world are not inherently bad, but it does just crowd out the consideration of God. Purity isn't taken seriously. It's very likely to die of neglect. Jesus spoke about our influence in society, in this metaphor found in Matthew 13, 33, a small amount of leaven brings about this enormous change. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this leaven in the same way that a small amount of leaven permeates the dough 
and gives it shape, so does the kingdom of heaven give shape and texture to society. The pure in heart are the redemptive leaven in our world. And the leaven, they are the leaven that keeps our culture from losing all its flavor. The pure in heart encourage others to be better. And they, the pure in heart keep the corrupt from destroying society. Without the pure in heart, the world would collapse under the weight of crudeness and selfishness. Because you see, no one wants to live in an utterly immoral, impure world. The person who lives by lying hopes that other people will tell the truth. Otherwise, his lies would be meaningless. Just as the counterfeiter is out of business unless somebody is making real money. The drunken driver hopes he or she is driving in a world of sober drivers so he can be safe when he's driving. And the tax dodger counts on other people to pay their taxes so they can enjoy the benefits of it in their society. If everyone were like the tax dodgers, the drunken drivers, the counterfeiters, and the liars, the, the world would collapse. The impure are leeches on society, depending on others to keep their world safe so they can practice their kind of irresponsibility. So, the whole world depends whether we like it or not, recognize it or not, the whole world depends on the uplifting, redeeming influence of the pure in heart. So, what are the benefits to the pure in heart? Scripture says they get a special vision of God now, it's easy for us to imagine purity in heaven enabling us to see God. But what about this world? All of us see <clears throat> what we are conditioned to see, and we hear what we are conditioned to hear. So the pure in heart see God in this life, in the here and now, in ways that others can't imagine. Just think about it. Um, I have started developing some hearing loss, and I notice that if I'm in a situation where I know what to expect the people to be talking about, it's easy for me to discern what they're saying. It's easier for me to discern what they are saying. But if they're talking about something I'm not familiar with or don't expect, I have to ask questions or really lean into it or miss, miss a lot of it. So we hear what we are most familiar with. Us. We hear best what is most familiar to us. And the artist sees colors that most of us don't see. The musician hears notes in the sympathy, in the symphony that are never detected by the average person's ears. We, <clears throat> as humans, notice what we have carefully trained ourselves to notice. You hear or see or experience what you expect. So it is that the pure in heart see God. By the singleness of of longing, that hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the pure in heart train themselves to grasp the vision of God that others miss completely. If you walk down a city street with a friend who loves nature, 
it's very likely that as you're walking along amidst all the, the noises of the city, that they will say, did you hear that? And they will be referring to the sound of a bird or the sound of a cricket. Um, one of my family members, I, I, I have been a sort of a amateur bird watcher and bird listener for, for years and um, have spent a lot of time with my grandchildren noticing birds and noticing their sounds. And, and uh, one member of the family said, they're all y'all are always pointing out uh, a bird that you see or a, a song that a bird sing. I don't hear that. I don't ever see that. It's because they have not trained themselves to notice that. So in this realm of spiritual purity in heart, if you walk down this uh, walk someday with someone pure in heart, they might say, see, there's God. God is at work in our world. The pure in heart are sensitive to God's presence and activity more so than the average person. So the pure in heart see God. God is the ultimate expression of purity. So who would be able to see God except those who are pure in heart? And think about it, to go through life without seeing God is to miss the point. If you noticed one day when you're doing your, your scripture reading that the words of the scripture are sort of blurry and you have to move your text back and forth to try to find the place where you can see it more clearly, what do you do about that? What do you do if you don't have a clear vision? You go to the eye doctor and have him take a look and write a prescription and get you some glasses that correct your vision, that enhance your vision. So what do we do to get purity of heart so that we have a clear vision of God? Well, the truth is God is offering those opportunities to us all the time. Um, now, most of us by this stage in our life have to take some medication. Even if you don't take medications, when you are looking at television, you will see lots of commercials about medications, which include a list usually of a lot of side effects. Each medication carries with it some side effects. And when they talk about the side effects, it's most often negative side effects. It's like the medicine um, might, will make you dizzy or you, it might make you uh, sleepy and fatigued or it might cause nausea or an allergic reaction. Outside of the realm of medicine, pollution. Pollution has a side effect. It leads to problems with uh, the air and breathing. It leads to lack of clean water. Um, a drought has a negative side effect. Besides the failure of crops, um, it, is, it makes uh, the vegetation susceptible to fireworks or matches that are, or cigarettes that are thrown out carelessly. And so a side effect of a drought, we have to be careful about fires. Many, many of, when we talk about side effects on this earth, we're usually talking about negative side effects of something. Purity of heart is a side effect. But in God's kingdom, side effects are positive. Side effects are gifts. Side effects are, are blessings. So God offers us positive side effects for our living according to his, um, his ways. And it develops in us as a, uh, this purity of heart develops in us as a side effect of our love and devotion to Christ. 
given half a chance, Jesus will capture us. Purity of heart, by the way, does not mean sinlessness. It doesn't mean there's no sin left. Purity of heart um, does not mean we have a sinless life. Just think about it. Noah was a man of God's own choosing, and he got drunk. Abraham was a man of God's own choosing, and he lied and misrepresented himself and his wife. Uh, Moses was chosen by God, and he disobeyed God. David was a man after God's own heart, and yet he set up Uriah's murder and committed adultery with Uriah's wife. Peter, Peter was a man after Christ's heart, was a follower of Christ, and yet he denied him three times. So the scripture is quite clear that we can be followers and there are still going to be vestiges of our sinful nature that we come across uh, all the time. The truth is that the most conclusive evidence of our pure heart is an awareness of the remaining impurity in us. The more we recognize the impurity in us, the closer we are getting to being pure in heart. That's one of God's uh, unique paradoxes. So get, giving Jesus a chance, just half a chance, and he will capture us. With him, we get a singleness and a wholeness in life. We start becoming pure in heart because he is pure in heart. And that is when we will be enabled to see God. We will be able to see him in our daily walk here on earth. And we will be able to see him person to person, face to face, being to being in the eternal world. Our um, joys and concerns um, this week, uh, there are several folks healing from falls, and we just, uh, I'm not going to name all of them, but just keep folks in, the, in your prayers that have had falls and are healing from them. Uh, continue to pray for the Mikulskis um, and for Dottie as she fights her cancer and her pain. Um, and I think... I would continue to pray for the Harris family in their time of grief over the loss of Virgil uh, and for Barbara in her um, and her health. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for all the ways that you have given us opportunities to see you, to hear you, to, to see your activity in the world around us, to see your generosity and your love and your mercy, your joy and your peace, to see you, Father. And we ask that you continue to cleanse us Find those areas that we've that have gone unnoticed that need to be cleansed and open us to that. Father, we lift up as our hearts have been softened. We have concern for those from our faith community and those from our families and those from our neighborhood and from our congregation who 
are experiencing difficulties in their life of one sort or another. We ask for families to be healed. We ask for babies to be strengthened. We ask for those who have fallen, for their bruises and bumps and broken bones to heal. We ask for those whose illnesses have um, are continuing to offer challenges to them. Give them strength to endure, to give them some relief from pain, to give the doctor some wisdom in dealing with them in new ways that might grant them relief. We seek more than anything, Father, to be able to share in community with these we love and who love you that we might help to build your kingdom. There are also many others who are, are traveling, Father, and we ask for traveling mercies for them, that they might find rest and relaxation and that they might certainly find safety in their travels and return to us renewed and restored by you. And for brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering obstacles and challenges of all sorts, we lift them up, Lord. We entrust them to your care. We are promised your intervention, and we lean into that. And we hope that they will be leaning into all that you have to offer them. For it is great. We seek and hunger after your righteousness. We seek your mercy and hope to be able to be merciful. And we seek to become pure and cleansed and undiluted in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please continue to read Matthew 5, 1 through 12 as um, a reminder of the totality of the Beatitudes and to continue to learn how they fit together and influence each other. Let's read our closing. Sent forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing. The people of God from this dwelling take leave. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer the call.